The lieutenant, normally seen at this time, will not be seen this evening in order that we may bring you this special program. NBC News presents Cheney, Goodman, Schwerner, a special report on the three workers for civil rights still missing in Mississippi and a review of the motives and forces behind those who plan to carry on the work. Now, here is NBC News correspondent Frank McGee. First, the known facts. James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Schwerner went to Mississippi to help register Negroes as voters. It had been stressed at the training school they had just completed that their purpose was not to stage sit-ins, marches, or demonstrations. It had also been stressed that the federal government could offer them little protection. Cheney, a 20-year-old Mississippian, was a veteran of the civil rights movement in his home state. He assisted in the training classes. Goodman, 20, a New York college student, had never participated in the civil rights movement, but a friend says Goodman could never understand how some people could be so lacking in compassion. Schwerner, 24, a seasoned New York social worker, left Mississippi, where he had worked since January, to assist in the training school at Oxford, Ohio. The first one-week training course was completed a week ago yesterday, and 175 students began drifting toward Mississippi. Last Saturday morning, June 20th, at 3.30, Cheney, Goodman, and Schwerner left Oxford for Meridian, Mississippi. They left early, they said, because they did not want to arrive in Mississippi after dark. At 5.30, they arrived in Meridian and decided to go to Longdale, Mississippi, the next day. A Negro church slated to become a civil rights center had been burned in Longdale. Sunday morning, June 21st, at about 9.30, they left Meridian. Schwerner, following a routine practice, had said if they did not call or return by 4 that afternoon, something would be wrong. It's 35 miles from Meridian to Philadelphia, then 12 miles to Longdale, where the church had been burned. That afternoon, the three were seen at the church site and at the home of its lay leader. About 2.30, they headed west toward Philadelphia. At 4 o'clock, Deputy Sheriff Cecil Price says he stopped the car just inside the city limits of Philadelphia. Price says it was going 65 in a 30-mile-an-hour zone. At first, he says he did not know they were civil rights workers. He jailed them. By now, the three should have phoned in to Meridian. They had not. Around 6 o'clock, those in Meridian began calling jails in the area. About 8 o'clock, they contacted a Justice Department official, Frank Schwelb, who was in Meridian on other business. Civil rights workers say Schwelb called the jails, including the one in Philadelphia, and was told no one by the name of Cheney, Goodman, or Schwerner was there. Deputy Price says only the jailer and his wife were in the jail while the trio was under arrest. They will not talk to newsmen. By 10 o'clock, Price says he had located a justice of the peace who fined the trio $20. Price tells what happened then. They paid the fine, and I released them, and they escorted them to their car, and uh, they got in their car and left, and I asked them which direction they were going. They said they were going to the Meridian, Mississippi. And uh, at that time, I was riding in the city police car with the city policeman. Uh, we followed them several blocks and saw that they were headed toward Meridian, Mississippi, down Highway 19 South. Uh, at that time, we turned around and came back to inside the city of Philadelphia. And uh, that's the last time we saw any of them. The three had last been seen heading southeast on Highway 19 about 10.30 Sunday night. On Tuesday at 3 p.m., the FBI, acting on a tip from Indians at the Choctaw Reservation, found what remained of the station wagon on Highway 21 northeast of Philadelphia. The car was in a marshy area about 50 feet off the road. It had been gutted by fire. The Mississippi Highway Patrol said there were no bullet holes. The car was taken to a Philadelphia and locked in a garage where FBI experts have been examining it. They've disclosed nothing. Discovery of the car intensified the search for the men. More FBI agents and Mississippi police were assigned to the operation, augmented by 200 sailors from a nearby base. Part of the search has been along a gravel road, State Highway 492, that connects the other two highways and along which the men may have driven or been driven. It is hostile country with a hostile attitude towards civil rights workers. A report from John Chancellor, NBC News, New Orleans. There are two and a half million acres of woods and big swamp in Mississippi, 
This is Boga Cheetah, one of the biggest and deadliest of the swamps. 100 men are picking their way through it today, looking for Cheney, Goodman, and Schwerner. But the plain fact is that 1,000 men might not disclose whatever secrets lie under the green slime of Boga Cheetah. This is backwoods Mississippi, silent and suspicious. The silence and the suspicion is felt here at the county seat, Philadelphia, where Cheney, Goodman, and Schwerner were arrested for speeding. The concern in Philadelphia, Mississippi today, however, is not so much with civil rights workers who have come and gone, but with others on the way. This morning, 50 men signed up as volunteer auxiliary policemen under a plan formed weeks ago. The auxiliaries will be empowered to arrest civil rights workers. Not all the reaction to the invasion of the civil rights workers has been official. There have been, for example, five church burnings in the past dozen days. All the churches were Negro churches. None of the fires of accidental origin, no arrests. This, this is one of them, the Mount Zion Church near Philadelphia. The fire here brought Cheney, Goodman, and Schwerner up from Meridian to investigate into the dark lowlands of Neshoba County. This is the Sweet Rest Church of Christ Holiness at Brandon. A week ago, somebody tossed a bottle full of gasoline through the unlocked door. This is the Holy Ghost Baptist Church at Clinton, Mississippi. Somebody poured kerosene over the floor and lit it, but firemen saved the building. This is the Church of the Holy Rosary in Hattiesburg. Nobody knows how the fire started here, but the pastor of this Negro congregation says it was surely arson. There have been more incidents. Today, three men from Itabina, Mississippi, arrested by the FBI because they molested civil rights workers, were bound over to a grand jury. It is generally believed that things will get much worse before they get any better. Just one week ago, the three missing boys underwent orientation at a small college in Ohio. For a report, here is NBC's John Palmer. This quiet, peaceful lagoon could be found most anywhere in the state of Mississippi. But this is not Mississippi. This is the Western Woman's College in Oxford, Ohio, the scene for the past two weeks of a quite unusual, unprecedented gathering. Some 700 college students from as far away as Boston and Southern California, ranging in age from 19 to 26, have come here to take part in a program called Freedom. Freedom for Mississippi. They pledge to go to Mississippi to help register Negro voters and to conduct freedom classes. The Reverend Bruce Hansen, a minister on leave from Washington, D.C., was chosen to head the program. Reverend Hansen, where did this idea for the conference come from? Well, the idea came from uh, some people in the National Council of Churches in consultation with leaders of the various civil rights groups became apparent in December or January that the group of, of civil rights agencies in Mississippi was going to launch a massive recruitment program to bring students into the state from all over the country to work in voter education registration, to work in educational programs and community development. Now this size program had never been undertaken before. And it soon became apparent that there might be problems in providing orientation and training. And this is where the National Council became concerned and approached some of the civil rights groups, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, Congress on Racial Equality, NAACP, and the, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Reverend Hansen, do you think a student could feel free to leave now if he felt that the dangers were so great that he or she did not want to take the risk? That's a, a very difficult question to answer, and it's one that we've talked about uh, among the staff a great deal, because we constantly remind people that they have a right to leave. But there's also operating the, the factor, which is inescapable, that anyone who leaves seems to be abandoning or betraying the people who have disappeared in Mississippi. And we just try in every conceivable way to make people realize that they'd be jeopardizing themselves and the project unless they're thoroughly convinced that they want to go and work in the state, even in the face of such events as these. Reverend Hansen, what is your feeling when you see the bus pull out and the students heading for Mississippi? Well, it's one of fear and trembling. 
and it's one of, of hope, and it's one of admiration. It's one of fear and trembling because there's no way within a, a training experience that people can be offered uh, concretely the kind of conditions they're going to, to meet in a very different kind of environment. And it's one of hope because the skills that are developed really have a great deal to say about what's going to happen in the future, in the long-range future in the state of Mississippi for both Negro and whites in that state. And it's one of admiration because when one considers the risks that are involved and when one considers the fact that some individuals who are now missing are known to these volunteers, you begin to realize that some of these volunteers have a sense of what must be done. It seems to be part of uh, almost a Peace Corps spirit that pervades part of, of America now. And a sense of the urgency of the racial crisis in this country that gives them the strength to go in and do these kinds of jobs. Before these students were allowed to come here, they were interviewed, screened, and in some cases rejected. The first group of 375 students left the campus nine days ago and made the 15-hour drive to Memphis, then on to Mississippi. Among this group were the three missing boys who disappeared 24 hours after crossing the Mississippi border. When news of their disappearance reached the campus, some of these students, who were just beginning their week of training, began to have second thoughts about going to Mississippi, but none dropped out. Dr. Robert Coles, a psychiatrist on leave from Harvard University, had the job of counseling the students. Dr. Coles, what personal need does this trip to Mississippi fill for these individuals? That's a very good question, and uh, I think uh, to some extent this is as uh, varied as there are individuals here. Uh, but the thing that has impressed me is that they're not a group of mixed-up, neurotic young kids. Dr. Coles, what was the reaction here at the training program when word came that the three were missing? I think the reaction was at first one of shock and genuine horror. I think a lot of these students, there's no point in denying it, were very frightened and uh, began in their own way to wonder about whether this would happen to them in the future and how they would handle a situation that must have confronted these three people in that town in Mississippi. It was really as astonishing for a psychiatrist like myself that watches people facing fear and facing uh, anxiety to see how the mind can not only be defeated by fear but can use it constructively and use it as a leverage point in, in mobilizing effective action. And that's what we've seen here, I think, in the last week. Throughout the past week, this bulletin board held an eerie fascination for the students. It carried daily bulletins concerning the activities of the students who left this campus only a week ago for Mississippi. It told of progress being made and reports of two bombings. On Friday, it carried a simple message, still no word on our three missing friends in Mississippi. During the day, they attended classes, classes offering subjects never before taught at this Oxford, Ohio campus. They were taught Negro history, the voter registration laws of Mississippi. Time and time again, they were warned of what lay ahead, hardship and perhaps personal danger. They were taught how to react when confronted with hostile segregationists, how to protect their heads, how to ward off blows, how to fall. Staff workers of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, one of four civil rights groups sponsoring the program, along with the National Council of Churches, conducted the training. The students were subjected to all forms of physical and mental abuse. During leisure time, some played cards, some watched television, others read, but many preferred to be alone, each with his own thoughts of why he or she decided to spend the summer in Mississippi. Well, you're a junior at Harvard now. Will this interfere at all in your schooling? I don't see how it should unless uh, I am jailed in Mississippi uh, on one pretext or another. Isn't this a distinct then, possibility? It's a very distinct possibility, and the problem would be, uh, in the first place, getting bailed out. That would, might require a lot of money. 
more money than I might be able to obtain. Then the other problem is even if I am bailed out, the question of going back and having to face trial, as a number of people have to do, uh, and being continually called down there and away from my schoolwork. Did you talk this over with your parents before you made the decision? Yes, right. I discussed it with them, and they felt, of course, what I feel, and that is fear of, of what might happen there. Uh, arrest is actually the least of our worries. We all know what about the three people that are missing now in the show, and we all are thinking the things that might have happened to them. This could happen to any of us going down there. Uh, but we felt this was something that was important enough to do that it was worth taking those kind of risks, that is, that I should go. Beef, the Justice Department, has said that they simply cannot provide protection for all of the students that are going to Mississippi this summer. Do you feel at all that the government has let you down in this regard? Very much so. It's not only let me down, but it's let down the entire nation. Uh, the nation is not a democracy simply because I can vote when I become 21 in New York City, but only if everyone can vote uh, and practice uh, his right as a citizen. And the federal government, I think, has betrayed its responsibility to enforce the constitution of our country in Mississippi. In your opinion, is the federal government capable of, do they have that many men to guard the several hundred that are going into Mississippi this summer? No, they certainly do. Uh, and they can certainly hire them. I mean, a marshal costs a certain number of thousands of dollars a year. I'm sure the federal government can provide that kind of money. Uh, they can nationalize the guard in the state, whatever it takes uh, to do something like this. I'm certainly sure they could provide all of us with sufficient protection. Do you worry about what's going to happen to you in Mississippi? Do you worry about physical harm that may come to you? Very much. This is something which I, I had to think out before I even decided uh, whether to apply to the program. And that is whether or not I was willing not only to face a beating, but whether or not it was something worth being killed for, because that's certainly what all of us face when we go into that state to do this kind of work, and that is death. Um, now even more, now that we're down here in Oxford and training and hearing daily about the bombings and the arrests that are going on down there, uh, people who'd left just a few days before we did, exactly people like us going down to do the same thing, you think about it, of course, much more. But it's the, the same feeling. This is something that you have to do, you should do. What is the mood here at the training session? Is it a happy one, an optimistic one? Is there great it's worry about the future? Very great worry, I think, among people. It's a very, very sad mood whenever we think about the three people that are missing down there, who, some who just left a few days ago who went down to do something for us, really, and in the same way that we're doing something for everyone else in the project and while working together in this. It's a very happy mood, though, I think, in the sense that we all feel hopeful that we are going to be able to do something. And when we sing songs together, I think a lot of us mean it, that we shall overcome and that something really will come out of this summer. And so I think it's, it's a combination of a lot of moods, really. Nick, some officials in Mississippi have termed the northern students that are going into Mississippi as outsiders. Yet you are from England. Don't you consider yourself even more of an outsider? By Mississippi standards, I don't think there's much difference between England and New England, for instance. But, um, but I, I don't think we are outsiders because Mississippi is part of the United States. Mississippi is, is part of the of, a, of a, the community of free democratic nations which comprise the free world. A and what happens in Mississippi is, going to, is affecting deeply uh, what, what's happening all over in the rest of the world. And uh, the well-being of my own family in England, and of all the people I know in England, and the, and the, the whole of Europe is, is very, very closely tied to, to whether the people of Mississippi can arrive at some kind of reconciliation Nick, in your own mind, have you thought about the dangers in Mississippi, that you might come into physical harm? Uh, yes, I certainly have. And I, I think uh, that there's not one of us here at this orientation who aren't afraid at this moment, who, who won't be afraid every moment of every day that they're in Mississippi. But, but th this, this fear is something one's got to try and 
that we've all got to try and live with because uh, we can't stop operating just because we fear Mississippi and we fear what may happen to us there. And we've got to think in terms of it, that that e even if if what some of us are killed, even if I am killed, we we will have been we will have died. Each death is going to bring Mississippi nearer to reconciliation. These students representing the second and final group in this program have now left Western Women's College in Oxford, Ohio. They're on the road now, headed for a summer in Mississippi. Before they left, one student told a staff member, I guess now I know how it feels to be a soldier in an LST headed for shore. All of a sudden, the ramp falls down and you wait ashore, hoping that the reception won't be quite as bad as they said. John Palmer, NBC News, Oxford, Ohio. This last week has been painful for the families of Cheney, Goodman, and Shorner. Bill Ryan, NBC News, talks to the Goodman family in their New York City apartment. I can't help thinking about the last time that I saw him. When was that? Which was June 13th, almost, well, just two weeks ago. And, you know, when young men get to be 20 years old, they don't hug their mothers or kiss them very much, as it should be. But, of course, he was going away, and we both knew he was going into a dangerous situation. And we both knew that there were things that he was going to have to face. And, well, I just, well, we just embraced each other as he was about to leave. And I felt his warm, young body and it was beautiful, as all young men are beautiful. Is he a strong young man, Mr. Goodman? He is a strong young man, but a gentle young man for all his strength. What role did he play in the family? What sort of a participant was he? So three of our children are each different one from the other. But he had a way somehow or other of working things out and between the old one and the young one, who do have many things in common and, and in that way would tend to come in conflict. But Andy was, well, the mediator. Did he ever mediate between you, the parents, and his two brothers? Oh, I, I think that if Andy felt that what we were doing or, or the way that we were handling the situation was wrong and uh, in the sense that he would take the, the point of view of one of the other boys, he would say so. Mm -hmm. Of course he, he would. He would be quick to respond in either of our actions to something that he felt was unjust. He may not have understood why we took a certain action, and this doesn't go to any age. And his answer would be something to the effect that, uh, well, as you know, little children will say, that's really not fair. And he, he had a keen sense of what was right. We both are quite desperate to hear from him and we would implore anybody who sees this program to just send any information or give any information at all to those people who are actively trying to find the, those who have been missing since last week. But I don't have to tell you that we're heartbroken and want more than anything in the whole world to hear from our son and anybody who can help to establish contact with him we would be grateful to them you know we've been talking about Andy and we've said many things and he has many different kinds of uh, characteristics but one thing I think we said that he has beauty and you know, the world needs beautiful people. Andrew Goodman had been slated to work in a community center set up by Michael Schwerner in Meridian, Mississippi. John Chancellor reports on that project. The city of Meridian is headquarters for civil rights workers in five counties of eastern Mississippi. Mr. and Mrs. Schwerner went there six months ago to set up a community center for Negroes. 
The center is on the second floor of a downtown building over a barber shop and a taxi dispatcher. There is no COFO sign outside, only the number 2505 and a half over the entrance. This is where Schwerner taught remedial reading and political action. Assistant Director Preston Ponder and Mrs. Michael Schwerner talked to NBC's Thomas McCabe there. We have uh, some, of the, some of the purpose of it. Some of the things here is libraries, uh, sewing classes, which is operated by Mrs. Schwerner, where she receives clothes, clothing from the north, uh, material, things like this, uh, sewing machines to help out down here people that can't, don't have the money to buy these things. Uh, we also require that people be either registered to vote or will go to register vote, to vote before they receive these materials. We are, have a system set up called the Block Captain System with canvases, canvas, the community, uh, and the rural areas lack. We <coughs> not only work here in Meridian, we work five counties. We try to work five counties in the eastern part of the fourth congressional district, which we are in now. Did Mr. Schwerner ever tell you in his own words why he came down here? Yes, he uh, often told me that he came down to uh, help, his, help, help his self, in a way set himself free to you know, constantly say on his conscience, he feel that if he's white, you know, he has something on his conscience, he feel guilty about this and he would like to relieve himself somewhat. For himself, he hoped to find something meaningful. He wanted to do something that he believed had to be done and he wanted to find what he could do about an intolerable situation. Um, for the people here, he wanted to do whatever they wanted him to do. What kind of man is he? He's a very patient, gentle man. He very rarely yells. He has come out of jail on numerous occasions talking about how convinced he is that the people who hate must be pitied and understood rather than hated in return. He believes very strongly that hate is an answer to nothing. He does not believe in any situation in hurting a fellow human being despite what the provocation may be. Do you feel that your husband has been murdered? I don't know. I don't want to say. I went yesterday to attempt to see Governor Johnson to express my concern, to make a personal plea for his help, to express to him that even if he disagreed with everything I believed in, that I still considered him a human being, and I hoped that he would consider me one. I hoped that he could put aside his prejudices long enough to listen. When I went first to the state capitol building in Jackson, I had a door slammed in my face. I was pushed out of the way by some fat old man, and a door was slammed in my face. Uh, I report, we then went to Mr. Dulles, who, after keeping us waiting 40 minutes, granted us a, about a two-minute interview. He shook my hand and said he expressed his deepest sympathy. He said, Mrs. Schwerner, I want you to know I express my deepest sympathy for you, but I have another meeting that I must rush off to. I guess I, at that point I wasn't very patient anymore, and I yelled at him. I said, I don't want your deepest sympathies. I want my husband back. Mrs. Ben Cheney, mother of one of the missing men, lives in a two-story wooden house in Meridian with walnut and willow trees in the yard. NBC's Richard Galeriani spoke to her there. Ms. Cheney, do you think your son is still alive? Yes, I'm hoping that he is. I'm hoping that he is. How did you feel about his getting involved in a civil rights movement? 
Well, I felt, I mean, when he, I didn't think nothing about it when he first started. But after he was in Canton for a while and told me, he came home and told me about how it was and everything, then we discussed it. And he told me, he said, well, Mother, that's what I want to do. He said, because this is not for me and not for you. This is for all, for everybody. I said, well, he said, that's what you said. Don't help me and, and the family. He said, try to help everybody. I said, well, I know that too. I said, but be particular. Take care of yourself. What kind of a boy is your son? He's a nice, malicious child, honorable child. And he brave. Whatever he went for, he went for it with all his mind and heart. He wasn't afraid. Were you ever afraid for his life? Well, no, I wasn't. You never thought he'd get in trouble? Or well, danger? I figured that he probably would get in danger or something of the kind, but I felt like that uh, Mr. Swanner was, would, you know, was with him all the time, and he would guide him and show him the way to keep out of danger. Mrs. Cheney, the wife of one of the missing white men has said that the only reason this case has attracted national attention is because there are two white northerners involved. Do you believe that? That's right. How do you feel about that? Well, that's what I feel, too, because I, if he was by himself, I doubt that we would ever know anything because it has happened around in Mississippi before with other colored people. Have you talked to the mothers of the other two missing boys? Yes, Mrs. Goodman and Mrs. Swan. I talked with them yesterday over the phone. What did they say? Well, Mrs. Swan, she said that she knew my heart because we was on the same thing, and uh, we joined together and just pray and trust that there we will see them alive. We will return to our special report with Frank McGee after station identification. French Foreign Minister interviewed via satellite Sunday at 6. Sensitive questions of state and federal law are involved in the search. Yesterday, NBC's John Chancellor talked with Mississippi's Governor Paul Johnson, Jr. The line between state authority and jurisdiction and federal authority and jurisdiction has been drawn pretty thin in Mississippi. Governor Paul Johnson has had excellent relations with the FBI agents who've been swarming over his state, but he was, to say the least, bewildered when he learned that Washington had mobilized federal forces to help in the search. Uh, the first thing that I heard about it, uh, John, was uh, from a UPI report that came in. I think one of the girls working here in the Capitol told Senator Barber, my press secretary, that it was on the UPY and he ran and got a copy of it saying that there were 200 Marines and eight helicopters that were being sent in here. It was quite a surprise and a shock to me uh, because I had felt that the authorities in Washington surely would contact me before they sent these people in. As a matter of fact, it should have been done. Uh, you're violating the Constitution of the United States by sending any troops in for any purpose. Uh, but that was not the question. We're delighted to have uh, these troops in to help us out. Uh, but the amazing thing to me was that I had already offered the National Guard of 12,000 men. and. Uh, to search the swamp, and if that's the purpose for them being here, it was the search, then our people are certainly better shaped to do that than would be uh, 200 sailors, a lot of them who've never been off concrete in their life. Would it have been a constitutional act on Washington's part if they'd checked with you beforehand? Um, I don't think it would have been, but I would have been delighted to have them come in. Uh, if they felt that that was necessary to help out on the search. Uh, we are not interested uh, uh, in the constitutional questions at this time from the standpoint of seeing that uh, these youngsters are located. Uh, 
everyone in Mississippi wants to see them found, and the quicker the better, in order that they can complete their job and get out and go back to the normal routine of their business, the state troops, uh, the state troopers, uh, the local sheriff and his forces, and the federal government forces. Governor, do you rule out the possibility that it's a publicity stunt or a hoax, as some people here in the South have charged? I don't rule that possibility out, John, because on anything of this type, uh, I would be afraid to make any kind of guess. Uh, it could be that it is a hoax to attract attention on this effort of these little groups that have failed, uh, but that is something I do not know, and I wouldn't want to make the prediction that, that, that it is a hoax. A point of view is offered by Burke Marshall, an assistant attorney general in the Justice Department in charge of the Civil Rights Division. Marshall is interviewed in our Washington studios by NBC's Ray Scherer. Mr. Marshall, we've just heard the governor of Mississippi make the point that using servicemen in this search is unconstitutional. What would be the Justice Department view on that charge? I don't think there's any question about that, uh, Ray. Uh, it's traditional. It's been done often, time after time, to use uh, military uh, forces to help in a search. Uh, if they were being sent in for a law enforcement function or something like that, it would be a there'd be a different question. But I don't think there's any constitutional question involved at all. And, of course, these men were already there. They were stationed there. Is that why they were sent rather than the original announcement Marines, because they were close at hand? Yes, they were convenient. They were convenient, and they needed more men to uh, search the swamp. That's all there was to it. Now, there has been a certain amount of pressure on the President and the Justice Department to send in federal marshals. Is there any legal basis for that? Well... Uh, Ray, it's a, you know, the federal-state relationships are complicated, but basically, basically, we all accept the fact that the police function is with the states. And as long as it's working and functioning and the states are doing their job or trying to do the job, it doesn't make much sense, really, to displace a state police authority to take acts that would displace it, as, as uh, sending in marshals or troops would, uh, rather than trying to take some course that supplements and helps the state in what it's doing. And that's uh, it's that course that uh, Mr. Dulles recommended to President Johnson. That's the course that is being followed now. That's, that's one part of it. Second part of it is that it's, it's uh, is really practical, not practical. Uh, the, uh, there are uh, 600 marshals and deputy marshals in the entire United States. And they work in district courts. They serve subpoenas. They uh, uh, really keep order in the courtroom. That's their function. 600 in the whole United States. If you send them all into Mississippi, you leave the rest of the country. Uh, yes, Europe. that's right. And then there are questions that are legal questions that are very complicated. The uh, most that they can do normally is enforce federal laws. Well, uh, federal laws don't deal usually with acts of violence and crime. They deal with all sorts of economic regulation and other things, but generally speaking, when we look to protection against violence, we look to the states and state laws, not federal laws. What preventive action is the Department of Justice taking in this Mississippi situation? Well, the, uh, some weeks ago, uh, President Johnson directed on the recommendation of the Attorney General uh, increase in, in efforts to uh, penetrate the uh, activities of the Klan and that kind of group, and that's been going on for some weeks. We can do that. Mm. That's being increased now. Uh, President Johnson again has asked the FBI to uh, increase its activities, and we'll continue to do that. We can send uh, more lawyers in. We can work on uh, such violations of federal law that we as we discover. Uh, when we can discover them, we can try to act promptly, as we did uh, yesterday when the FBI arrested uh, three men in Itabina, uh, Mississippi, for uh, threatening some of, uh, some of these uh, students, summer students. 
and uh, we can do that sort of thing. We can cooperate with the state, but uh, we d don't uh, have a police force, and that isn't the federal function, and that kind of activity should be avoided. One final question, sir. Is there anything new from the government on the disappearance of the three men? No, uh, no, there's nothing new. Search continues. Yes, the search continues, and it will until until something's found or or they uh, turn up. Thank you for bringing us the Justice Department view. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. And now back to Frank McGee in New York. Some Southerners are charging hoax, publicity stunt, blaming outside agitators, but there are other points of view. Again, John Chancellor. Mississippi in the past few days has become a kind of giant amplifier for people with views on civil rights and on the disappearance of Cheney, Goodman, and Schwerner. Here, out of a cacophony of comment, are the views of four men. Uh, certainly, I have uh, been in consultation with various members and people in the area, and uh, we have come up with some information that satisfies us of the fact that all probability this is just another hoax. To suggest that three dedicated, committed young men, like these three, could intentionally pull something of this sort, or that the organizations with which they are working could do it for the sake of a headline, is sheer, unadulterated nonsense. i sorry for any children, any youngsters, whose parents do not insist that they stay away from other states, trying to tell the people of other states how to conduct their affairs because they do not know uh, what it's all about. And it's pitiful that parents haven't trained their children in the way that they should have. They ought to stay at home and work. They ought to stay at home and tend to their own business. And uh, we will treat anyone with great respect here in Mississippi. Anyone who comes here, as long as they do not uh, disobey our laws, but we will treat the people who come here, these children, like any other backward children should be treated. And I'd call them backward children. I don't pull any punches on that. Uh, backward usually means deficient in, in mental capacities. No, not a... that. They just haven't been properly trained. That's the trouble with them. Um, hearts and minds have not been molded in the right direction. And they're going to find that out, and you're going to find it out. There is within the state a cleavage of opinion as to what constitutes law and order. For some, law and order denote a return to the unrippled pattern of life of an earlier day. Disorder is equated with the Negro's attempt to change the pattern of a society structured on race. Acts of violence are regretted and genuinely regretted. There is the feeling, however, that the Negro has somehow brought all this on himself. If he would be quiet, if he wouldn't rock the boat, then things would be like they used to be and peace and tranquility would be ours again. There are others in the state for whom this romanticized pattern of an earlier day constitute anything but law and order, peace and tranquility. They see the old pattern as a bondage to second-class citizenship, and they are determined to break out of the role assigned them by a racially structured society. We may refuse to accept the cleavage as real. We may prefer to say that the difference of opinion is imported by outsiders and that if they would just leave, then everything would be well again. If all the outsiders would leave, if all federal agents would leave, the cleavage would still be here. Four views on the Mississippi problem. There is still dialogue in Mississippi, but less and less discussion, which is part of the problem. In contrast to the sudden and violent incidents being reported from the South during the past few weeks, there has been the long consideration and almost complete passage of the most far-reaching civil rights legislation ever before the United States Congress. Robert Abernathy, NBC News, Washington, reports. There's hardly anything in the civil rights bill that would help those in the Mississippi Summer Project. What they want is police protection, and the federal government is not in that business. But this is true. 
If the Civil Rights Bill were now law, as it almost certainly will be in another week, and if that law were being obeyed in Mississippi, there would be no reason for the summer project. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 is not going to create instant brotherhood. No one pretends that. But it does give the Attorney General of the United States more power than he's ever had before to try to stop the most obvious practices of racial discrimination. I'm not a lawyer, but I've covered the fight over this bill since a year ago last June 11th, when President Kennedy went on radio and television to announce that he was going to ask Congress to make the commitment, in his words, that race has no place in American life or law. I've talked with some of the men who wrote and rewrote the Civil Rights Bill. I hope I can report what it will and will not mean in our everyday lives. This is the first page of the bill as it now stands, the 7,152nd House resolution to be introduced in this session of Congress. Surprisingly, after a year on Capitol Hill, this bill is stronger than the one President Kennedy first requested. For legislators under pressure from civil rights groups it's been a long, hot winter. The House passed H.R. 7152 last February. The Senate passed it with amendments June 19th. Next week, the House is expected to approve the Senate amendments. President Johnson should have the bill on his desk by the 4th of July. Here are the major provisions of the bill. First, what it says about the right to vote. Registering and voting is a problem for most Negroes in the Deep South. The registrars often keep them waiting a long time, sometimes ask them questions not even courts can answer. In the 11 states of the old Confederacy, about 25% of all the people of voting age are Negro, yet fewer than 12% of all the registered voters are Negro. There are five counties in Mississippi, each at least 57% Negro, in which no Negroes at all are registered. So the Civil Rights Bill begins with a part, a title, on voting rights. It says everyone who wants to vote has to get the same test, and that if a state requires a literacy test, that test must be given in writing, and anyone can get a copy of his test. The Civil Rights Act of 1957 gave the Attorney General the right to file suits to prevent discrimination in voting, but sometimes these cases almost get lost in the courts. One of them in Louisiana was filed in July of 1961 and didn't come to trial until February of 1964. So the new civil rights bill gives the attorney general the power to ask that a voting suit be heard by three judges, not just one. Presumably, this will help overcome the delays created by a judge who may himself be a segregationist. Next, Title II, perhaps the most famous part of a civil rights bill, that having to do with public accommodations. Remember the lunch counter sit-ins, the demands that Negroes be served in businesses open to the public? This is what this part of the Civil Rights Bill is all about. The Commerce Department made a survey not long ago. It reported that between Washington and New Orleans, along the main highways, the average distance between decent sleeping quarters for Negroes was 174 miles. In some parts of the country, it's easier to get a room for a dog than for a Negro. Some people argue that a businessman has the constitutional right to serve or not serve whomever he pleases, but the Civil Rights Bill forbids discrimination because of race in the following. Restaurants, cafeterias, lunchrooms, lunch counters, soda fountains, gasoline stations, theaters, concert halls, sports arenas, stadiums, and all the big hotels, motels, or lodging houses. Now, it's also important here to say this. The Civil Rights Bill does not prohibit discrimination in the following. Retail stores, private clubs, bars, bowling alleys, barber shops, beauty shops, and small rooming houses with five or fewer than five rooms to rent and in which the owner lives, too. I said barber shops are not covered, but there is this exception. The bill bans racial discrimination not only in hotels and motels, but also in public accommodations that are part of hotels and motels. So a barbershop by itself can discriminate, but a barbershop in a hotel cannot. Also, remember that swimming pool in the motel in St. Augustine, Florida? The bill would ban racial discrimination there, too, on the grounds that it's part of the motel. 
All through the Civil Rights Bill, the hope is that practices against the law can be dealt with locally, voluntarily, before the federal government steps in. So if there's a public accommodations complaint in one of the 31 states which already have their own public accommodations laws, that state gets the case first. If there's a complaint in one of the other states, then the court would refer the matter first to a new community relations service. But if the Attorney General thinks there's a pattern or practice of racial discrimination in public accommodations, he can file a suit. The Attorney General also gets some new power to try to speed up public school desegregation. Here are the figures on this. Of 2,256 school districts in the Deep South this spring, 1,813 had no desegregation at all. Only 1.18% of all Negro children in the Deep South are in school with white children. There is no de school desegregation at all in Mississippi. Those who wrote the Civil Rights Bill hope to raise these percentages. But this should be said, the bill specifically does not empower the federal government to require that children be carried from one neighborhood to another in order to achieve racial balance in the schools. And there is nothing in the bill about private housing, who you can sell to, or rent to. One part of the Civil Rights Bill which provoked loud Southern complaints in Congress is that part which says that wherever federal money is used in a segregated program, the federal government can cut off the money. This could affect hospitals, college building, all federal aid to schools. It's highly unlikely that this part of the bill would be carried out. For one reason, any agency thinking of cutting off funds would have to give Congress 30 days notice and Congress could be expected to protest. But civil rights advocates find it ironic that in 1962, for instance, Mississippi, where there's no school desegregation, got nearly $2 million in federal aid for its schools. Perhaps the most controversial part of the civil rights bill is that aimed at discrimination in employment. The unemployment rate for Negroes is more than twice that for whites. Those who wrote the Civil Rights Bill just cannot believe that racial prejudice does not play a part in this. So they would set up a bipartisan Equal Employment Opportunity Commission to investigate and try to eliminate racial discrimination in hiring, firing, or union membership. No company or union would be covered for a year. The coverage would start gradually, but eventually it would apply to every company and union with 25 or more employees or members and this would be 29 million of the country's 73 million employees. Most department stores would be covered under this title, but unless they have restaurants in them, they would not be covered under the public accommodations title. So, a department store with no restaurant could refuse to serve someone because of his race, but it could not refuse to hire him for the same reason. There is much more. The hearings on H.R. 7152 took up nearly 5,800 pages, the debate 3,500 pages, but these are the highlights. It is essentially a lawsuit bill. The Attorney General gets new power to bring suits against racial discrimination in voting, in public accommodations, in education, in employment. If a court finds you guilty of violating some part of the civil rights law, and if you continue violating the law, you can be fined or put in jail until you stop violating the law. Finally, Senator Hubert Humphrey has called the Civil Rights Bill the greatest piece of social legislation of our generation. Now that it is about to become law, the question is, will it be enforced? If it is, it could bring the greatest social revolution of our generation. Apparently, the Justice Department thinks it will be enforced its Civil Rights Division is asking for permission to hire another 55 lawyers, twice as many as it now has. And those who lobbied so effectively for the bill also expect it to be enforced, but they're under no illusions about this. They know that neither laws nor lawsuits change hearts. In the final edition of the newsletter they sent out during the Senate debate, the civil rights lobbyists wrote, paraphrasing Robert Frost, the job is done but we have miles to go before we sleep, and miles to go before we sleep. As yet, of course, there is no end to the story of James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Schwerner. Events are fluid, 
and there is no final conclusion. But for a summary of the situation in Mississippi, we return again to John Chancellor in New Orleans. Late this afternoon, the search for Cheney, Goodman, and Schwerner shifted to the Pearl River near Philadelphia, Mississippi. Boats carrying game wardens and FBI agents are now dragging the river. Elsewhere, the search continues with elements of the Mississippi Highway Patrol still checking the back roads around the edges of the Boga Cheetah Swamp. The underbrush is dense, the weather very hot and very humid. So far, despite the task force, no clues that we know of, no developments. Earlier this afternoon, President Johnson ordered more FBI agents into Mississippi. They will work with the approval and cooperation of Mississippi's Governor Paul Johnson. Governor Johnson seems sincere and determined to deal with the events of this troubled summer in harmony with his namesake in Washington. But the difficulties facing President Johnson and Governor Johnson are not at the top. They are somewhere in a dark bottomland, and the troubles are as yet unresolved. John Chancellor, NBC News, New Orleans. One of the most persistent questions is why so many young Americans have become committed to the cause of the American Negro. There has, in truth, been little in this soft society created by those who grew up during Depression and war to stimulate and challenge their children. But now, as the Depression and war did for their parents, the civil rights struggle has tapped the strong currents of idealism that run in the children. So, in Oxford, Ohio, young men and young women take up the burdens of their convictions and those of Mickey Schwerner and James Cheney and Andy Goodman. The time has finally come, without ceremony, occupied with the paraphernalia of departure, with hasty smiles and farewells, they go. Some, like these, are tonight on their way, prepared to pit their faith against their fears. They have not been handed a perfect society, and so they are working within a society that permits change in the search for perfection. Frank McGee, NBC News. Next week at this time, see the lieutenant.